So we're gonna hit a thousand subscribers today and it's gotta be on St. Patrick's Day, which a lot of people consider a very lucky day as well as a lot of people drinking. Not me though. So um, I just wanna say thank you very much everybody. So we're gonna continue making videos. Uh, we're gonna try to get, next we're gonna try to hit 10,000 subscribers then 100,000 and then 1 million and then just, we're just gonna keep going for as long as we do. I literally like this. Either until something happens to YouTube or uh, this channel or uh, or uh, what, what is it? Um, but basically, we'll just keep making videos. I, I like doing this, so hopefully you guys enjoy it. But anyways, let's talk about, I, I was kind of talking to someone earlier. I was going to go back to this anyways, but I just uploaded it, you know, because my channel is usually an archive channel. I usually just, I'll come back to it at some point, but, but I'm going to come back to it in this case. So I uploaded two videos the other day without commentary. One of them was the gym leader original order, and then there was nine something badges. Uh, well, actually, it was nine badges in the image that I uploaded, but I want to confirm something first, okay? So the nine badges, they technically could have been any badges because, you know, if there's nine badges, that means there's nine gym leaders at least. But the thing is, we don't know who the ninth gym leader was. We do know that for a fact, though, that when Pokemon was originally designed, they still did kept the uh, the gym leader order, uh, but it was a little bit different. Um, so the very first trainer you would have fought was a much, you know, he could have been recycled into Giovanni. He could have been a different character at one point, but then I guess Nintendo decided, well, you know, we're gonna take him out. So the Viridian City gym's locked because they had to rewrite the whole story for Giovanni then because now Giovanni's the main villain, Mewtwo's backstory, uh, Lavender Town, Saffron City. The whole thing had to be moved around a little bit. But eventually they just expanded the, the idea and they gave Giovanni the gym still, but you know, you had it, but it came back as the last gym leader. This is how it originally went. So the character that would have been Giovanni or the youngster that was starting off as a gym leader would have been the first gym. Brock would have been the second gym leader. Misty would have been the, same, uh, the third gym leader. Lieutenant Surge was the fourth. Erica was the fifth. Um, Koga was sixth. Blaine still was seventh. He didn't change aside from his character model, believe it or not. They mixed him up with the Silt Chief. You might have heard about that one, but uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and uh, Sabrina was the very last gym leader. So, but then in the final version of the game, what we got was they took out the one trainer that would later be recycled into Giovanni. They moved Brock, Misty, Lieutenant Surge, um, Erica, Koga, Bl um, and they moved them all down one rank except for Blaine, Blaine stayed where he was at. Uh, they opened up the sixth position and they took uh, Sabrina, moved her to the sixth, slot six. Blaine stayed in the same position. Then they took uh, Giovanni after the whole story was done, all the way up until the seventh gym and you were looking for the eighth. Then they moved Blaine to the, or uh, not Blaine, uh, Giovanni to the eighth gym and they kept him there because you know, hence, you know, he was a gym leader and the organization of Team Rocket. So, you know, basically you had to figure out where, where the eighth, you know, all the other gyms were, if there were any more, but I think I have a theory and this is, and this is still up in the air, but, uh, and I'll even make another video talking about this once I find more information about it, if I do. Uh, so basically if you're somebody who studied like the beta maps and all that, you'll know that there was supposed to be another town, one that was never even in the final version of Pokemon. As a matter of fact, it's actually in the game's coding, but as it's saved as a different area you can fly to, but the game just crashes because it's not finished. So, but here's what happens though. If you were to go south of Celadon City, again, Celadon City is the where Erica is, you know, just uh, west of uh, Lavender Town. It's just on the same plane, but just to the south. There was supposed to be another village you could go to or another town you could go to. And I guarantee you if there was another gym there, but they didn't add any more towns, that would have probably been where one of the, the two gyms possibly could have been. And then, you know, maybe Lavender Town probably could have been another town that had a gym, but like they took it out and then they just kind of rearranged it. Because those are the only two towns that I can think of that you can go to all over the Pokemon games or uh, Gen 1 that does not have a gym. The two towns. So that would make perfect sense in the sense that if you want to start and say that there was maybe nine or ten gyms at one point. If there were only nine gyms, maybe Lavender Town didn't have a gym. Maybe it was that one town that we would later go to. But again, what was that town and who would have been its gym leader? I don't know. And what kind of gym it would have been? I, I couldn't really say for sure 100%. Unless, of course, and this is assuming that they kept most of the badges and the, uh, 
the 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 gym types the same. You know, like Misty's a water type, Brock's a rock type, um, Lieutenant Surge is electric, Erica was grass, Koga was poison, and ghost type, believe it or not. Because Haunter and Gengar and all that, but he used he used a couple Haunters. Kind of makes sense. You know, kind of would also explain, like, you know, like, why people debated the whole Koga and uh, Sabrina had, should have had their badges switched together. Maybe at one point that's what the reason for it was. You know, they were still probably trying to decide who gets what and what kind of typing they should have been, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's interesting to think. Then there's also, if you remember, uh, that one episode of the anime of Pokemon where, um, you know, Gary had 10 badges. And that would explain where they had the concept for 10 badges. Because, you know, Pokemon came out in Japan first and they were still changing things. Even, even when they dubbed it in English at the height of its popularity in 1997, I believe. Or 1999. I, I gotta remember. But uh, when Pokemon first came out, I mean, even the very first episode was backtracking a lot of stuff that they would later change in the series. Because at this time, they were, because when they dub an anime, if you don't know this, it's already been done in Japan, but they're going back and just redubbing the audio. They're not like making, unless they're censoring it, you know, they keep, they usually keep the animation the same. So they were using the same animation from Japan. As far well, not as but not as far as like they didn't censor the uh, the ideas that they had for the uh, like the way some of the things were in the anime that could have been in the games. Like Gary had ten badges, he didn't have eight. You know, he was just kind of joking around, like saying, "Hey, you know, he's got ten badges." You know, but it's like, but you know, you you would kind of kind of write it off. Oh, it's just Gary Oak being Gary Oak, but. At the same time, though, you know, there was an idea at some point that maybe there was originally going to be more than eight, ten badges, or maybe even nine, you know. Who knows? But then, but again, then raises the question, who were the other, who's the other and the other two gym leaders, if that is the case. So, that's actually still kind of a bit debatable, although maybe it could have been one of the, uh, maybe it could have been some of the younger children that we uh, saw in the prototype, some of the beta characters that we didn't know about. Um, who knows? You know, it's, it's anything's possible. What I want to know right now, and I've, again, I've made a video about this, and I know it kind of came off misleading a little bit because I couldn't fight, figure out another title. But, you know, we still have to figure out, like, who the original 113-plus uh, missing Pokemon designs are for index numbers. Like, you have, like, there was originally 191 of them. Then that's when they cut it off for Gen 1. And then Gen 2 already had, like, another 100-something they were going to work with. It was like, but, you know, but when they started designing Gen 2 prototype... The earliest build we have is uh, they stop. They stopped at Gen uh, like 300. Like some of the very first Pokemon that we know of stopped at 300. And you know, even Satoshi Tajiri stated that that's where they kind of started and began a new Pokemon game. Was you know when Gen One was done, they had roughly 300 something designs. And you start thinking, well, you know, it, it would make sense they probably carried it over. But if those illustrations still do exist, then we could kind of get an idea of like what Pokemon really did exist and we can kind of like interpret our own based on the beta designs and all that. And so it would be interesting to really think about how, you know, how many Pokemon were really different at that time. Like you had like 192 all the way up to 299 and that's already like 108 if my math is correct. And then there's, um, there was some, there was like five, four or five of them plus baby Kangaskhan. I'm thinking there's a baby Kangaskhan because one of them we actually had a blur image of, but it was, but the back sprite and the front sprite in the game was nowhere to be found. We probably took that out, but it's funny how we at least had one image to go off of. And you know what? I'm certain it's a baby Kangaskhan because looking at uh, Cubone's back sprite and kind of comparing it, it kind of looks like Cubone, but a little bit more younger though. Not to mention you kind of see it like uh, laying down, looking up at the sky. And there's an image on the internet where like you can kind of see the same thing with Kangaskhan doing the same thing. Baby Kangaskhan. So, I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe they thought, kind of like the same reason they scrapped some of the baby Pokemon in Gen 1. Like Bitty Bat, for example. You know, maybe they figured, well, Zubat was probably already small enough. You know, it kind of makes sense. And then they probably thought, well, you know... If we're gonna scrap even more Pokemon, you know, you know, maybe they figured, well, baby Kangaskhan could basically be a baby Cubone, you know. So, you know, it kind of made sense a little bit. Is it really that much different? And, and and it's true because it's like if you really do think about it, you know, baby Cubone is kind of baby Kangaskhan but with its mother skull on its head. 
So they probably figured, well, you know, there's probably not too many different similarities. But I still do think it would have been really interesting if they would have kept Oregon, or uh, not Oregon, uh, Orphan, if that's what it originally was supposed to be called. Because then we can kind of get more backstory that we could kind of even see what Baby Kangaskhan would have looked like in Baby Cubone. Because while, yeah, it's obvious that Cubone is a Baby Kangaskhan, and we basically already know what Baby Kangaskhan looks like, you know, it would have been interesting to see what the similarities could have been. But I think, but again, I think they, they say they, like even with Gorochu, like Pokemon, they stated that the reason why Gorochu was uh, actually cut, and if you don't know, Gorochu was a Pokemon that Raichu actually evolved into. If my math is correct, it should have been when you give Raichu a Thunderstone. Pikachu would evolve into Raichu at, so I think it was like level 24 or something like that. Or you could just go catch a Raichu in the wild, basically, you know. And so they would say, you give Raichu a Thunderstone, and then they booted that up to, uh, and then Raichu would evolve into Gorochu, which is like a, a very, very strong uh, mouse Pokemon. <laughs> I mean, even, might even give Zapdos a run for its money with uh, the amount of electricity it could produce. But maybe not, though, because, you know, electricity, you know, Zapdos was a legendary bird, so its powers were, you, you don't want to tamper with it, you know. And again, which is why I always recommend when you're going to catch like legendary Pokemon, uh, if you're trying to catch like Zapdos, start off with Zapdos, I would recommend using Rhyhorn or something that has like lightning rod or something that's a rock type, something that's going to be able to tank like drill peck and stuff like that. Because Zapdos is kind of a bastard to catch sometimes, but you know, but if you have the right Pokemon, you buy yourself some more time. So that's always a good thing too. So <laughs> know your type advantages. Um, but anyways, so, but yeah, I, I basically wouldn't be surprised that they just moved things around. Because again, most of the ideas were still used in the end, but it's just, you know, what Pokemon and what ideas and concept arts did they change over time? Because maybe the ideas were just a tad bit differently compared to the final releases of the game. So we do know for a fact that Kanto... Because Pokemon was originally designed in 1989, and then, you know, it was under Cap Poo Monsters, Capsule Monsters. And then I think Yu-Gi-Oh! took the idea in their own sense, so they kind of got a hold of it a little bit. So that's why, uh, you know, the uh, Capsule Monsters and Yu-Gi-Oh! actually got its arc. And then you had the original, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, see, in Generation, and then when in Generation 1 came out, you know, six years prior to that, we had six years of lost history of Pokemon, and, you know, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised Game Freak still has this saved in their data vault somewhere, but, you know, when and where somebody will release it, if they ever do, or even one of the employees there, I mean, we'll just have to keep an eye out for what happens. If somebody finds data, I'll definitely talk about it, you know, but until then, it's just, you know, we have to have ideas that do kind of add up you know we, it's all theories until we can prove it at least but i wouldn't be surprised there's tons of lost history with pokemon but I, I, that's the one thing i really want to know more of right now is the lost designs if we can just get our hands on them i wouldn't be surprised that because again you know even if it, I, i'm trying to think was it ken it's like sugi mori or something like that i i i'm not pronouncing his name right because i forget how to spell it but uh, Ken, the guy that was the lead producer, the, the, the lead uh, illustrations producer of Pokemon, the guy who basically was in charge of all the Pokemon illustrations, the ones that we know of today, or most of them at least. He's been there since the beginning. If, you know, because every time, even in Pokemon, you know, this is a fact. Every single time a Pokemon's like redrawn, they go back and they write an index number on it. Or they go back and they, uh, they rearrange it with a different number the ones they decided on, or, you know what I mean? So, Rhydon was originally the very first Pokemon that was ever created, and then Kangaskhan was second. Um, so, if we can figure out what the original index numbers were, and again, not going based on just the uh, index numbers of the National Dexter, if we can somehow figure out what those original index numbers were, we could figure out what Pokemon are missing. Because the index numbers, again, we're looking for are, there's a few of them that I still would have to give you that are lost between the 121 or the 191. I believe it's Kang Kangaskhan. Baby Kangaskhan was 135. It was right next to uh, pre-evolved Meowth. What we actually got, it was actually called Konya. 
in the original. It was a Pokemon evolved that into Meowth and then evolved into Persian. You can kind of see a pattern here. Like every Pokemon family was supposed to have at least three Pokemon, it seemed like. That's kind of what they kind of had the idea of. And then they kind of knocked a few of them out and, you know, just kind of left it at two. And then there was a ton of Pokemon that, you know, they didn't even have, like, their pre-evolved forms. I mean, wait until we get into Gen 2 prototype data. It's nuts. I'm still digging through it. But there's, like, uh, there, like if you remember not to evolved into Zatu, there was a Pokemon. I don't even know what its name was that actually evolved into its, like, halfway point. That You know, you would have a Pokemon that would go from this little, little baby bird Pokemon that just hops around trying to find stuff. And then it would evolve into a big bird like Zatu, where it literally would just stare at the sun all day and it could predict the future. And <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but then they had like this pre evolved form of it where it wouldn't stand on its legs. It was kind of like a Pidgeotto style bird. It kind of like, you know, it had its talons, its legs, and it would just go around pecking at the ground and all that. It didn't stand on two giant legs with its wings tucked down, kind of like it's a gentleman, sort of. It's uh, actually pretty interesting how they uh, wrote that. Um, but you get what you kind of get an idea of what we're dealing with, you know. There could be any kind of Pokemon, like 113 designs at least is it's a lot. But what those Pokemon are and who they are, it's debatable. There's also the possibility, and I mean, I'm still kind of debating this one because, like, there's three other slots within the original 191 where it just they used it as a placeholder maybe they could have been three more pokemon that we didn't know of like for example um one of them was oh geez like one like three of them were supposed to be like a beta larvitar a beta pubitar and tyranitar and then you know but this is where you start really thinking they had these ideas at the time and some of the pokemon that were actually betas that we did get like roradon was actually a beta tyranitar and maybe desalia or whatever it's called the pokemon that looks like literally a substitute doll when somebody uses the move substitute looks like a baby larvitar just a little bit different though um i wouldn't be surprised that the concept arts that they did have were eventually based on like you know uh, ultraman 7 because if you don't know ultraman 7 was what kind of inspired the power rangers but if you're like a big fan of like old uh japanese monster movies and all that you'll be a huge fan of like you know some of the stuff that japan came out with like those old monster movies because you know it's kind of like how they got the transformers how they got the power rangers it was all thanks to like Ultraman 7. It was huge in Japan when it came out. It just like the people who originally created it. And it, it was it was nuts, man. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised that's where like it, Gundam came from, Zoids, sort of. Like it, it like a lot of Japanese culture got it from like those old monster movies, which is pretty cool. But anyways, um, but yeah, so Pokemon was based on a lot of other things, and there's a lot of Pokemon that were based on, like, unused characters. Like, I mean, like, I, I thought it was pretty cool. Like, there was one Pokemon from, like, the Gen 2 prototype that, while it's not part of the original 300 that I can think of, um, maybe they maybe a lot of these Pokemon were moved over to Gen 2 at one point because they wanted to probably use them. See, this is, what I, this is what I'm finding out the more I talk about these videos. As confusing as it does sound, a lot of these ideas were eventually recycled into something else. If we could just figure out what that is and why, then it would be interesting. But like one of my favorite Pokemon, there was a Pokemon like it was called like it was like a bell ringer sort of Pokemon. It was a cat. It was a dark cat. The dark type. And it was based on Luna from Sailor Moon. If you if you remember Sailor Moon, Luna was the uh, the black cat, the one that would always walk around with uh, uh, what was her name? whatever i'm trying to think what sailor moon's original name was not not when she was like fighting but when she was like just a high school student but um it was interesting to think like uh like japan like like satoshi tajiri really did take a lot of inspiration from like all sorts of things like i mean it wasn't just one series it was like you know they took this they took that and they made like pokemon designs like it was like they did the research you know they really spent a lot of time on this stuff it's crazy but I would say what originally inspired Pokemon altogether was Ultraman 7. That's basically where they got most of their ideas from. What really started the whole series was Ultraman 7. Which I'll be honest, I just started going back and watching all the episodes. On, I, I think you can find them on TV and all, or on uh, YouTube. They're, they're there somewhere. Somebody's got them on the internet. But you got to watch them at least once. It's just interesting how like, you know, for something that was made like almost 60 years ago... 
like how good it looked. It just, it was really cool actually. <laughs> so yeah, but anyways, uh, yeah, hopefully that's a little bit more information on like some of the Pokemon we're looking for, um, the gyms, the, the badges. Again, from what I, I understand, Pokemon was just basically, they took a bunch of stuff and rearranged it and then they just moved it somewhere else. But that's basically what we're still trying to figure out is what ideas did they have and which ones didn't make the cut. And, you know, maybe somebody can like recreate it somehow in their own way, like, you know, because people make good ROM hacks and all that. So that's what I like to talk about. I try to encourage more people to find this stuff so we can talk about it and keep this history alive. Because I think that's what Satoshi Tajiri really did want. If, I'll be honest, if I was Satoshi Tajiri right now, I would literally release like a lot of the, the prototype data because maybe they have it in their data vault somewhere that, you know, maybe most people don't even know about. I just think it would be pretty cool like to see like what, how many Pokemon did they really scrap at the time? Because if I remember correctly as well, even when Gen 2 originally was supposed to come out, they asked them, how many Pokemon did you guys totally have at that point? Aside from the 251, of course, that we've got in the final version. And they stated there were literally hundreds of designs. This could have been front, back sprites, shinies um, that they all scrapped. Um, the concept art for original shinies looked a lot different. And they were actually a lot easier to get in the Gen 2 prototype. I think it was like a 1 in 64 chance rather than the 1, 1 in 8,192 chance. And I've gotten a couple, I've gotten a couple shiny legendaries without uh, hacking. You know, but it's interesting to think like, you know, if you want to see all the shiny legendaries, you either have to hack them or you have to, you know, because most people don't have the patience to sit there and keep resetting that many times and however long it will take until they get it. But it's uh, very interesting to think like, again, how many things in Pokemon you very well could just easily miss just by simply not seeing it there. So, yeah, so if that, so again, the way I look at it right now, um, if I find any more data, I'll just let you know. But that's really the best we can do. <laughs> so there's more out there. Expect more videos. And I will see you all next time. I uh, hope you guys have a wonderful day. Subscribe if you're not already. And we'll just go from there.